get started. I have an interesting presentation. You'll learn a little bit about what I do as the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator for the state of Illinois. I do have a surprise right behind me, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, but we're going to talk about trees, and we're going to talk about bees, and we're going to talk about the importance of pollination and identify which trees need bees and um, how can we provide better habitat, not only for the bees, but the trees themselves. So right now, I'm going to uh, turn off the microphone, and we're going to move through the webinar. If you have any questions, I can see the chat window. So uh, please feel free to um, type them in. I don't think I can have any audio. So sadly, I always like to chat with my audience members, but we'll use the window for today. All right, thank you so much for joining us. And if you have any questions, please let me know. And I'll be back to you shortly. I'm back on live shortly. My name is Trisha Bethke, as I had mentioned. I am the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator for the state of Illinois. So my position is funded from a cooperative agreement through the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and their Animal ha Plant Health Inspection Service, and the Morton Arboretum. And this picture is of me, and I am in the uh, Arboretum hanging on to a tree that was planted by May Watts probably about 100 years ago. So we're really happy to have these types of trees within our woodland community here at the Arboretum. So what does a forest pest outreach coordinator do? I generally work with lots of different partners, organizations, government agencies, private schools, public schools, the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, our national organization, our Arborist Association. You'll see many different uh, community groups that I deal with. And basically, I travel around the state and talk to people about pest threats. So how do we care for our trees in our natural areas and in our urban areas? and talk about how to plant trees, and then also talk a little bit about monitoring trees. So once those trees get in the ground, what can we do in order to improve the long-term survivability of trees? And as I was thinking about this presentation and studying a little bit of the background, I thought, wow, how cool is this? Bees play a huge role in creating nice, healthy woodland habitats. So basically what I do is I build partnerships. And I'm going to have a little fun right now. Travel around and I talk with people. And he is the forest pest outreach. So his mask has every federally regulated forest pest threat there is. And believe me, when you see the masks, not on VIN, um, but if you got it in your hand, it's a pretty cool mask. And if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to send you them. Uh, but basically, we use that in order to engage people and let them know about forest pest threats.
Can you hear me now? Oh, good. I'll back up a little bit for just a second. You saw the slides. I travel around the state and talk to people about tree pest threats. So today's I think we're having a little bit of a problem with the microphone. It automatically starts to shut off, and I'm not sure why. Well, let's try it again. Can you hear me? All right. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. Our spotted lanternfly is out in Pennsylvania, and we absolutely do not want this pest in the state of Illinois, but that is for another presentation. How many of you know uh, about the Morton Arboretum? Anybody that's out there can type in a message. Do you know about the Morton Arboretum? Excellent. Oh, good. The Morton Arboretum was founded about 97 years ago by the man uh, named Joy Morton, who's over in the left-hand corner. right? Today it has 1,700 acres, and it, yes, it does have the trolls. Uh, we have a center for tree science. We have a beautiful children's garden. We have nine and a half miles of hiking trails, but really the mission of the Arboretum is to collect and study trees and shrubs and other plants from around the world and to display them across the naturally beautiful landscapes for people to study, enjoy, and learn how to grow them. Our goal is to encourage the planting and the conservation of trees and other plants for a greener, healthier, more beautiful world. You could say right here on the conifer, we've got a beautiful new exhibit going in that talked about the tree threats uh, that are occurring around the world. So it's a really neat place. If you haven't been here, please uh, come out and see us. Additionally, we do have beekeepers on site. So the Arboretum has their own bee beekeeper, which is a neat job. We have two sets of hives, but those hives are not uh, accessible to the public and they aren't utilized per se for uh, tree pollination specifically in our collections, but we do have our own uh, Morton Arboretum honey. So we do actively manage them. We move them around and we care for them. And uh, we try, we run education programs on uh, pollen and healthy bee communities. About 10 years ago, there was a study done. And I'm only talking about this study because I think it highlights the importance of the trees that we had and the trees that we lost with Emerald Ash Borer. And it speaks to the need to have diversity within our trees. Our trees attract a myriad of wildlife, whether or not it's the bats, it's hummingbirds, it's bees, it's squirrels, any other type of wildlife, not to mention all the other insects. Uh, but in the Chicago region, which is the seven county region or in northern Illinois, we had about 157 million trees. And we went and did an inventory to figure out what condition they were in. And what we learned was that our canopy cover, so all the trees that were um, part of the Chicago can canopy or the trees within the, within the community, the large majority of it was European buckthorn, and we've got about 7% in ash. And when you think about biodiversity and you think about pest threats, 
today we're going to focus a little bit on bees and that, that wonderful association that they have with their trees in their community. But I also want to make you aware that when we don't have a diverse set of trees, you know, the biodiversity, those, those living things that support that healthy ecosystem can really truly change. So just wanted to give you a little bit of a snapshot of the uh, tree inventory that was taken. It will be updated in 2020, so we will see the effect of the loss of the ash trees. But for now, we are going to sit back and uh, look at some beautiful pictures. I had a lot of fun putting this together. It's pretty gray and rainy and cold up here in northern Illinois, so it was fun to take a look at all these wonderful bees and look at the great trees and also the flowers and think about what what is to come. Uh, pollination occurs when pollen is moved within flowers or carried from flower to flower by wind or water or pollinating animals. Almost 90% of all flowering plants rely on pollinators for fertilization. And about 200,000 species of animals act as pollinators. Pollination leads to fertilization and successful seed and fruit production for plants. Pollination also ensures that a plant will produce a full-bodied fruit and a full set of viable seeds for the next season. Worldwide, approximately, there are a thousand plants grown for food, beverages, spices, medicines that need to be pollinated by animals in order to produce the goods that we depend on. In the United States, pollination by honeybees and other insects produces approximately $40 billion worth of products annually. Our bees pollinate 80% of our flowering plants. And our bumblebees are important pollinators of wild flowering plants and agricultural crops. There are some key threats facing bumblebees that we can talk a little bit about at the end of the presentation. But I'd like to move ahead and talk a little bit more about The need, trees need bees and the bees need trees. It's a great uh, partnership that they have. The trees give the bees the pollen, which is the protein uh, to eat and to feed larvae. They also have nectar, which is like that carbohydrate. So if you think about carbohydrates as bread and, and food for energy, they give it uh, food carbohydrates to eat for quick energy and they convert that then to honey. And the trees also give the bees resin. The bees are able to make, um, it, they call it propolis, which is, I, um, I can't think of what it's called, but it's, it's like a re resin's kind of like a sticky property, and it keeps the hive clean and it insulates. So you think of it as like a sealant. It also gives a habitat. It has, trees oftentimes have hollow cavities and you know bees can shelter in there. And then if you think about it, what do the bees give the trees? Well, the bees give the trees life, uh, pollination. They fertilize the flowers so they can make new seeds and then grow either new trees or apples or pears or peaches. Um, so most people are familiar with the flowering annual perennials, like all the, f the flowers in the beds, but people may be less familiar with the fact that Bees often forage for pollen and nectar high in the tree canopy. If you think about it, trees densely covered with thousands of flowers give pollinators a huge source of nectar and pollen in one place. Foraging efficiency for bees is beneficial as it requires less energy for them searching for food sources and it also reduces stress. Bees rely on these food sources throughout the year and then typically trees that bloom early in the spring they give a benefit to the trees. Uh, summer flowering trees also provide a meal of nectar and pollen. Trees also provide great nesting opportunities. I just mentioned that before. Oftentimes, you know, when we see the holes in the trees, we can see some of these nests that are uh, have occurred. Native flowering trees are not only beneficial to bees and other insects, but they're also very beneficial to the larvae of many native butterflies and moths. How many of you seen this honeybee? 
honeybees are the most important bee worldwide. Very social, lives in colonies and trees or hives, and it is used for honey production as well as all of our agriculture uh, production. They carry the pollen in a little basket at the end, the bottom, the tail end of their, their bottom by their hind legs, and it's pollen sticks to all the like the little hair follicles that they have um, on their body. They also really live in large perennial hives, so those hives that are always you know available. They drink their nectar and honey through long tubes, and that feeding part or that sucking part is very important because they have to find the right type of flower in order to meet the right type of um, feeding tube or mouth part in order to uh, successfully obtain the nectar. This one, one of my favorite, oops. This is a bumblebee. Bumblebee is the only social bee native to North America. Typically makes nests close to the ground or in the ground. And this is usually the one that we end up seeing more often. And to be honest with you, these bees can really be uh, pretty confusing. Uh, once you um, once you start seeing them and you see them throughout the season, oftentimes I have to ask myself, is that a bumblebee, is that a honeybee, is that a wasp? So hopefully we'll have a better picture by the time we're done of which, which bee is which. But this is our bumblebee, is a very social bee, and it's uh, native to North America. It is large and it's very hairy and it's yellow and black and they have their beautiful clear wings. I think you can see the picture on the right-hand side with the circle that the honeybee is carrying that pollen away from the plant. Uh, interesting note that the queen only survives through one winter, so it could be a pretty fat, fragile species, especially uh, if things in our climate or in and around us change, whether it's too much rain, not enough rain, or a very, very cold season. They could be um, subject to some dieback. This is a mason bee. This mason bee is a very elusive bee. It's one of my favorite. Are you all familiar with this mason bee? Oftentimes they call it like a the urban bee. The mason bee generally is elusive species. It requires more research to better understand its preferences and its behavior. But its bee and its close relatives have been found to be very effective for uh, commercial raspberries and, and there are blackberries as well. Oftentimes, if you've seen a house that has those long bamboo tubes, those are built to house those mason bees. Another favorite of mine is this leaf cutter bee, which is a solitary bee. It cuts neat circles and leaves, and it uses the pieces to line their nests. They build nests in hollow twigs or other openings, um, and it's generally about the size of a pencil. And it usually won't sting anybody unless it is trapped. Uh, and this is also a, a helper to pollinator uh, alfalfa fields as well, or alfalfa plants. Um, I thought this was the first time I've ever seen this leaf cutter bee, and I thought it was pretty neat the way it actually creates these little round, perfectly round, I don't know if you can see it on the screen right here. They cut them out with their mandibles, and then they roll them up, and then they fly, they tuck it right in here, with, hold it with their legs, and then they fly back to the tube. So if you looked online, you'd be able to see, if you looked up leaf cutter bee, you'd be able to see them in flight uh, and trying to load their leaves into uh, their tubes that they have, their, their egg-laying tubes. We're going to move into now, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these beautiful trees that uh, use bees as pollinators, or the bees that use the trees as pollinators. Our flowering dogwood is absolutely one of the most, <clears throat> pardon me, magnificent native flowering trees. If you've ever been out to the woodlands early in the spring, 
Uh, it has long lasting, small, white, yellow, oftentimes it could be pink flowers, and the bees absolutely love it. The pollinators that are attracted to it are bees and wasps and flies, and often those beautiful uh, skippers that you see, the skipper moths, and some beetles. One of the things that I tried to do in this presentation is to identify those trees that are blooming chronologically so that you got start to understand that when we have a diverse suite of trees, we will have a better pollinator habitat. So the longer the bloom cycles are and the differing times by trees, the better off it, the bees are to be able to continue to get the nourishment and the carbohydrates and the proteins that they need. So it's pretty neat to kind of think about how when we look at our trees and we look at the timing in which they all flower, how it potentially could help build this wonderful pollinator partnership. Another crab apple species, uh, or another species is a crab apple. Crab apples are absolutely uh, wonderful tree, early blooming, pretty much right after uh, that dogwood, uh, eastern red buds right in there as well. One of the things that I didn't know about crab apples is that crab apples are oftentimes uh, used to have a cross-pollination with an apple orchard. So if you think about having the apple orchard and the trees all lined up, uh, oftentimes crab apple trees will be planted around the orchard because tree, apple trees need cross-pollination. So the bee takes the pollen from one and has to get pollen from a different species. So it's a pretty, pretty neat, not only is it a beautiful spring flowering tree and it serves as a wonderful source of nectar, but it also can be a beneficial uh, tree for our apple orchards. The eastern red bud, Eastern red buds, a member of the pea family, the leguminaceae. It is uh, often found as a tree that sort of hangs out underneath bigger trees in the open woods. Typically blooms early in the spring. Uh, they have bright pink flowers that cover the branches. They're tight clusters. One of the things that's great about this is that it attracts a lot of different pollinators. So the bees, the wasps, the flies, and butterflies, as we mentioned before, but the bloom period is from March through May. And so depending on where this tree is planted, uh, not only on the landscape, uh, whether or not it gets sun on the south side, typically they're blooming earlier than they do on the north side. Um, this could be a really good source of food for a number of different pollinators. The flowers are made up of five petals. And I think that's, you could see it right over here in the corner. You can see it right around here. These dense clusters of flowers are enormously efficient for our pollinators. So oftentimes, whether wind or rain, if they were to occur during the day when they're out foraging, oftentimes that is a wasted day. So they'd have to go back into the hive, back into the nest without any type of real energy or resources. So sometimes our rainy spring days can really create a difficult situation for foraging for our pollinators. How many of you are familiar with the tulip tree? I love this tree. It is such a beautiful tree. If you go to the Morton Arboretum and if you're at Thornhill, uh, there's a big, huge uh, tulip tree that's been there for uh, many decades. But it, it is also a very uh, attractant tree, we call it, to the bufflehead mason bee. Mason bee is that solitary bee that I mentioned before. This tulip tree is also known as a yellow poplar. It's handsome. Eastern hardwood holds a record for the tallest eastern deciduous tree in North America. It has these beautiful saucer-like blossoms that attract all sorts of insects and wildlife with its nectar. It has a six-petal flower. It has a green margin and orange, and it looks like it looks like a tulip sitting on top of a green plate or a green, um, you know, leaf, if you will. The trees flower 
at 15 to 20 year intervals. So it's not necessarily one tree that we would consider to be available on an annual basis, but when it does uh, flower, it is truly significant. The trees uh, flower from a period, oh, I'm sorry, the trees flower at 20 years old. So when they, when they reach to be, when they reach 20 years old, sorry, I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Uh, Oftentimes, trees have to mature before they set a flower and uh, have something that would be viable. So it looks like it takes about 15 to 20 years, and then it would continue producing flowers for over 200 years. Their flowering time is probably, I don't know, four to five weeks, maybe six weeks, and the flower is receptive for about 24 hours. So that means that there's a really limited window for those pollinators to move in and, and to grab that pollen and have that movement occur. One of the main pollinators is a bufflehead mason bee, which you see right over on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, the nectar and pollen attracts all different flies, types of flies and honeybees and bumblebees and other long-tongued bees. Uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird, also likes the tulip tree. It's a it's a pretty sweet tree. Nope. All right, moving on, we have the northern catalpa, catalpa specioso. This is one of my favorite trees. If you see this tree blooming, you'll see it. It has big, wide, heart-shaped leaves and these lovely white Cluster, uh, flower clusters. It typically blooms in the late spring or early summer and has big, as I mentioned before, nectar filled blooms. It's a very show, it's like a showstopper, very majestic. Uh, it also has an abundant bell shaped blossoms, and the flowers of Catalpa occur in large clusters, and I mentioned that before, and they have a bell shaped uh, to it. And they are very, very good for honey production. So the flowers of the northern catalpa were effectively pollinated um, by the bumblebees during the day and carpenter bees during the at nighttime. So there are two different species that actually rely on these trees, which is kind of a cool thing to think about. Habit main the main habitat pollinators are bees and moths. Um, but, Another tree, this tree is not necessarily native uh, to northern Illinois, but I didn't know if there was anybody that was dialing in from around the country, but one of the big pollinators is at the big leaf uh, maple, so Acer macrophyllum. It is a rapidly growing tree. It's very abundant in the Pacific Northwest. Has anybody seen one of these trees out in its natural range? Oh, good, good, that's great. It looks like a beautiful, beautiful tree. Uh, it has distinctive, brilliant yellow gold in the autumn. Its flowers are green and yellow scented and they appear before the leaves in March at low elevations. And then in southern part of its range, kind of in the southern part of uh, the Pacific Northwest, its blooms from June. And then it typically has about four weeks right after bud burst. And this has its pollinator. Uh, I like the um, the uh, the image, the little image over on the right hand side. This is done from the Department of Agriculture, and this is a great little outreach piece that talks a little bit about the big leaf maple and the bees that are associated with it. This is the yellow faced bumblebee, which is right down here on the bottom, seems to be a favorite pollinator of the big-leafed maple tree. Next up, this is the tree of love, they call it. This is a beautiful Artilia Americana trees, our lindens, or oftentimes they are called basswood as well, depending on where you are 
in the state. Uh, it flowers very heavily in late June and early July and sending bees into a nectar frenzy. They're just they're nectar gathering friendly frenzy. Uh, this is a very, very large tree and it typically has a tremendous number of flowers associated with it. Uh, it is prolific when it, people talk about nectar producing plant, especially in the eastern United States. Uh, it is a major consideration. This tree needs a lot of space, and it gives off this unbelievably wonderful, sweet scent about it right in the beginning of June. And um, it is a big attractant. So if oftentimes when we're walking by and we're in the Linden collection, you can stop. If you're very silent, you can hear the buzzing sounds of all the bees. I mean, that's how... Um, that's how a, well this tree actually attracts the tree. Um, moving right along, we've got the staghorn sumac, which is kind of our shorter, sh open, shrubby tree with a velvet antler-like branch, and it's got this beautiful compound leaf. Uh, the fruits of the sumac often develop uh, this distinctively furry crimson colored cluster that you could see in the picture and if it, it's been known to you know people have uh, been known to take the clusters and they boil them and oftentimes those clusters those flower clusters they taste like a, a, almost like a, a raspberry lemonade I can tell you honestly I have never ever done it so I don't recommend it but there are other people that have um, Carpenter bees like this plant, and I have never had a, a or seen a problem with carpenter bees, but the major pollinators are the short-tongued bees, and there's a picture over on the right-hand side. One of these really neat trees, so if we think the linden or the basswood tree is one of the top nectar-producing trees, our, its southern competitor is sourwood, and sourwood is typically a tree that we might find in southern Illinois, certainly in the southern part of the country. Uh, it is a native tree to North America, and it's not, it's one of the endemic trees that's not found anywhere else other than the United States. Um, cool part about it is the Native Americans, they used to depend on sourwood uh, as a good source of medicine to help out with, you know, like stomach aches and ulcers, like if you got a cut in your mouth or something. Um, they used it also to make lots of cool wood. But right now, while we don't use it in timber production as much as it used to be, because I think there are other hardwood species that are a little bit better, in the fall, the, sour, the sourwood trees are just brilliant. They have red foliage, they have drooping branches, uh, they also use it typically in, uh, as like an ornamental tree, so if you want that beautiful color on your landscape. It blooms white flowers and it resembles like the lilies of the valley. And if you look over on the right hand side, to me it looks like just a series of, oh, <laughs> they're wondering if it tastes sour. Uh, I, honestly, I don't know that. I would imagine that if you were to boil it, I don't know. I don't think it has the high tannins like a red oak does. So good question. I'll have to find out and get back to you on that. The blooms on the right side of it, they look like a bunch of bells that you put to get, you would string together and then you know you'd be ringing, ringing them. I, I think that that's a, a beautiful flower. It's very unusual. Uh, it's very their bloom time is is very long, and so it makes it a good source of um, uh, pollen and nectar for our bees. What makes and, and it's also a huge um, uh, honey that sourwood honey is apparently very 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 um, I guess it's very difficult to get if you don't have a lot of the trees but it's when it's available in certain areas it's very abundant and people love it and they one of the descriptions that said what makes the sourwood honey so this might answer our question unless there's sugar added to it 
The light amber honey is produced from the nectar of the sourwood, and it's considered to be unmatched by clover, orange blossom, or any other honey. People say that sourwood honey is a, has like a caramel or buttery flavor, which is a rich, you know, sort of lovely aroma, and it has a great aftertaste. So potentially the sap that was within that tree, when you actually, you know, um, tap the tree, get the sap out and then boil it down, it can have that nice caramely taste. So if you ever see any sourwood honey, now you know. What type of medicine was the, um, the type of uh, medicine that the sourwood was used for? That they used it for curing indigestion, asthma, and then some type of ulcers. So that's what they would use it. And I would imagine that, I think that they were chewing on it oftentimes, and when they were chewing on it, that they were sucking a lot of the, um, the fluids out of it, and maybe that was part of uh, the medicinal therapy. It doesn't say anything about boiling, but all good questions. Well, this is kind of a quick, quick presentation. It went a little bit faster uh, than I thought. Um, you know, I just have a couple of final thoughts, and if you have any questions on trees and bees, I'd be happy to answer them. Or if you have any questions about the Arboretum, I'd be happy to answer, or Forest Pest as well. But, um, you know, as we think about trees for bees, um, the role of trees and bees uh, cannot be underestimated. These trees provide bridge of flowers between the spring and fall, and oftentimes this is a pathway uh, for people who want to try to strengthen and improve and improve the health of you know our honeybees and our, our, our bee habitat, our pollinator habitat. Without the trees uh, as a food source, you know, we are really limited because some of these bumblebees, they're only attract they're only active probably two to three seasons. And if they don't have the summer food, the bees drop off, and then the production drops off, and then potentially the hive is weakened. So as we hear about colony collapse, that oftentimes relates to some of the things that are going on in and around. So any type of management that's being done for other pests that potentially could negatively impact them. You know, it, it's, it's interesting to read through the literature fully. So if you see big headline that says, you know, the colony collapse, understand why it is. Oftentimes, it's the timing in which the bees are able to forage and the tree is actually producing um, the flower. So in, sometimes there could be a mismatch and that bees could die potentially because there isn't enough nutrients available at the time in which they need it. Um, we talked a little bit about the honeybees. I mean, we mentioned a number of bees. Uh, but they also do their best in concentrated areas. So when we think about our urban landscape, oftentimes we have a lot of solitary trees. And so I think it's important to look at that grouping within the landscape. Um, oh, I'm seeing some good questions. Uh, Donna wanted to know whether or not they have online resources. We have online resources about trees, but I don't know if we specifically have online resources about bees and um, you know the nectar production. I know that the uh, education typically runs bee programs uh, during the spring, and then I think sometimes in the late summer when the honey is more available. So if you look at www.mortonarb, so it's m-o-r-t-o-n-a-r-b.org and you put in bees or you put in uh, beekeeping, you should be able to, to pull up some resources. Um, Alina wanted to know what the causes of this mismatch in the timing and why are the trees budding out earlier? Well, we've been thinking about this and we're looking at doing some phenological studies to figure out why there are shifts in the time that trees are leafing out. So if you think about when a tree starts to leaf out, its main uh, motivator is increased temperatures, longer days, and more precipitation. So you've got more rain. 
when we have days that are coming up, they're going to happen in March, that all of a sudden go up to 50, 55, 60 degrees, the tree sees that as a signal and they're like, okay, it's time to wake up, it's time to start leafing out and it's time to start growing and collecting energy with our leaves. And then what happens? We get a cold snap. And so there is a little bit of variability going on right now. Over the last 10 years, we've had increased springtime temperatures. We've had increased nighttime temperatures, coupled with increased humidity. And so putting those three together, it's sending earlier signals to these trees. And our native populations of bees aren't necessarily responding the way or as, or as acutely, if you will, as the trees are to the increased uh, temperatures and increased amounts of sunlight. So, how many bumblebees survive the winter? I do not know. That is a good question. If you registered uh, with Deb, potentially I could take some of these questions down and email you the answers back. You had mentioned resources. Some of the resources that we have here are mortonarb.org, Chicago RTI is our urban forestry uh, program, and then pollinator.org, Arbor Day Foundation, and the USDA APHIS. They are excellent resources. Um, what is my, what, what's my favorite type of tree? Oh my goodness, just like my children, I love them all. Um, to be honest with you, I absolutely love a shag bark hickory. I don't see it very often. It's kind of got like a really funky, fun bark that kind of twists and peels up. And it's got beautiful flowers. And every time I see it, it just makes me smile. I do love brooks too. And I have a third favorite. So I can't just have one. I do like... Um, uh, I do like Katsura trees. Katsura has a wonderful heart-shaped leaf to it, and it's right outside my office, and I look at it every day. So that's a favorite of mine as well. What's your favorite, Miss S? Miss Shay, I guess it is. Looks like Donna's typing too. Anybody chime in? Let me know what your favorite tree is. Ah, uh, a birch tree. Yeah, that beautiful peely bark. It's all, oh, I like them. Oh, sycamore. Yep, yep, I love sycamore. Probably the western white pine since it has the state tree of Idaho. Excellent. Yeah, dogwood's beautiful too. I love a dogwood too. The western white pine's a, a magnificent tree. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, that's about all I have for you now. We've got 15 minutes that we can uh, you can add to your day and and catch up. If you have any questions, my email address is on the bottom. I'd be happy to get back to you with the answers to your questions. I'm super curious as to figure out whether or not sour would really taste sour and whether or not they used, used pieces of it and boiled it or actually chewed it. So I will be doing my research later. You are welcome, Donna. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thanks to the team, Deb and Cesar Menendez. You guys rock at um, Elgin High School. I love you guys. Thank you for... Uh, allowing me to spend some time talking about trees and bees. You are more than welcome. Thank you, Melina.